righty. Hey, welcome sports fans. I'm Charles E. Smith Jr. And welcome to this special edition of Inside Sports. This is the Arizona Sports Report. And I'll be joined in just a moment by Sean Goyle. We're going to go ahead and break down all the sports in the uh, greater Phoenix area. And then it is playoff time for the NFL. So, of course, we are going to do a playoff breakdown. We're going to get my picks, Sean's picks, and we're going to have a lot of fun here, folks. Thanks for joining us. So without further ado, let me bring in my man in the desert, Sean Goyle. Homeboy, what's happening out there in AZ? Not much, you know, excited about getting the show started again. We had a little stumble there during the holiday season. Good to be back on and uh, excited to be talking about these uh, Arizona sports. How you doing out there? Hey, life is good. Actually, it wasn't a stumble. It was just, you know, things come up during Christmas and New Year's and trying to get presents and parties and then there's always pies and cakes and goodies and uh things before you know it the month of december just kind of races by you homeboy it's just kind of a blur from thanksgiving all the way until january 2nd i can only remember maybe uh two or three days right off hand yeah that's true man especially with all the holiday food i was in a, a food coma for most of it so <laughs> i know you were man <laughs> all right so let's get right down to it uh this is, of course, the Arizona Sports Report, as we said. So let's break down all the goings-on in Arizona. First of all, the end of football season meant the end of the season for your beloved uh, Arizona Cardinals out there. Uh, Larry Fitzgerald and the boys, they did, uh, you know, perform admirably down the stretch. That six-game losing streak in the middle of the season really kind of killed them. But uh, what do you see out there for the Cardinals, and is there hope for the coming seasons? Well, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, they, they hosted the Seattle Seahawks and had a great overtime win, 23-20. to um, It was in standard 2011 Cardinal season fashion, as it was, again, the Larry Fitzgerald show. He had nine passes, 149 yards, and actually had two great catches in the overtime drive, which set up Jay Feely for a 28-yard field goal to win the game. Uh, this was actually his 32nd 100-yard game and his sixth of the season. As far as the team accomplishment, this is their fourth overtime victory. All of them have been at home, all of them within the last nine weeks of the season, and the four overtimes win, wins are an NFL record. Now, one funny little comment that Fitz said at the end of the end of the season in the game was, I wish we could play more games in overtime. If we played 16 games in overtime, we might go 16-0. and 0. So, He had the right mindset. Um, it, it was a little tough for the season as it started. Like you said, you know, they started 1-6, and six, but luckily they were able to clean up and finish 8-8 eight and eight as they finished the season 7-2. and two. Um, Here's one good thing that they're boosting themselves into next season is Wisenhunt went ahead and said they're 1-0 in 2012, winning that opening game. So <laughs> There you go. They got, they, got a, they got definitely a little bit of power going into the next season. Um, the one thing that I, I want Cardinals fans to really look at and pay attention to is we may have a serious quarterback controversy. Um, you know, Kevin Cobb is the guy who we signed up for in the pre, in, in the, excuse me, during the offseason. He's a big contract player. But he missed seven games for us, four of them from turf toe, three of them because of a concussion. And we had John Skelton come in, step in, and he finished 5-2 and two as a starter. 6-2 and two if you call, count the San Francisco game where um, Kevin Cobb got knocked out. So that's a little great controversy that we're going to have coming into next season. Yeah, there you go. And, well, you, you think about it in that sense, a quarterback controversy is a little bit of a good thing to have in this case as far as in the uh, situation of the Cardinals because there was, of course, the all of the anxiety the going on as to what was going to happen when Kurt Warner left. And, you know, it's a little bit tough, but it looks like they've gotten the ship righted. Like we talk about, they were putting in new systems on offense and in defense. So all things told, I, I think they did okay this year. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you have to remember last year they also finished 8-8, eight and eight, but um... – this year's 8-8, eight and eight, I, I feel, is a little bit more um, successful and progressive as far as the um, staff that we have on, on, on the team now. Speaking of Patrick Peterson was a great pickup for the team. Obviously, he's going to his first Pro Bowl as a rookie. And finishing 8-8, eight and eight, it's not great, but it got us to get the Cardinals having the 13th pick in the draft. Hopefully, they can pick up some left guards and left tackles to give Kevin Cobb a little bit more security so he's not so skittish in the pocket anymore. <laughs> there you go. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, move on. As we know, it'll be just a moment here while we change panels. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, definitely. so basketball season finally started. 
Phoenix Suns uh, coming back from, you know, from the depths maybe. The Amari Stoudemire days are gone. What's happening there with the Phoenix Suns? Well, you know, the Phoenix Suns hosted um, the Golden State Warriors on Monday. They had, they had a great win, though, at 102-91. Um, it was a good team victory and a strong finish by Steve Nash and the Phoenix Suns. As Steve Nash scored 13 of his 21 points in the fourth quarter. And rookie Marquise Morris also added 16 points. Now, as far as the team effort offensively, they did great because Jared Dudley had 15 points on his own, and Channing Fry and Shannon Brown also added 10 points to each. The, the only problem here right now is, again, the, they started the season slow. We're, we're about six games in, um, but they're picking up the pace. Um, they're second to last in, in the Pacific Division with a 2-3 and three record right now. Um, here's one thing that, that kind of caught my, caught my ear was Nash said after the game, it's going to be tough. I haven't played in a long, long time, and it's only been two weeks of camp, with only two weeks of camp. Today would normally have been a preseason game number seven, so it's going to take time. And he was talking and referring to him getting into shape and in, in control of the team. But with a 66-game uh-huh. season, we don't have time for him to get into shape. We need to be in as many games now to as they always do uh, post-All-Star week. So they, they really need to step it up right now, and um, it's, it's not looking too good with the Mavs coming up next. All right, well, and the Mavs had a little bit of a hangover to start the season, but when you look at the Phoenix team overall, what would the prognosis be? Uh, do they have hopes of playoffs this year, or is it just going to be kind of kind of tough for them? Well, again, because there was no off season, um, a lot of teams are trying to find their own right now. I mean, granted, mm-hmm. the Heat are six and one, and they they they're already meshing pretty well. But uh, even the Lakers started slow, and like you said, the Mavs started slow. But the Mavs are now coming off of a uh, off of their slow start, but they got a great win over Oklahoma City, who was unbeaten. I mean, they beat them 100 to 87, and Nowitzki had 10 for 16 for 26 points. So it's not like the Suns don't have an opportunity to go into the playoffs. It's just they need to find out who they really are, and I think most teams are doing that right now. Um, The only way to really judge which teams may have a chance in the playoffs, I'd have to give at least the NBA um, a good about another 10 or 12 games to make a judgment that might be somewhat um, correct. All right, perfect. And let's go ahead and uh, go from the hardwood to the ice. The Phoenix Coyotes. Talk to me. How are the yeah, Phoenix Coyotes doing out there? Well, you know, the Yotes had to go and visit the St. Louis Blues, and they got pummeled with a loss of 4-1. to one. It was harsh because Phoenix started off bad as St. Louis scored two goals with four minutes left in the first period. Redeem Verbata gave Phoenix a chance by scoring on a power play, but the rest of the game the Coyotes were shut down as two additional goals were made, one in the second period and one in the third by, um, by the Blues. Now, they're, they're having a rough a rough time right now because now they're second to last in the Pacific Division with 42 points and 40 games played. Now, it's a tight race in, in that division, um, and they're a long way away from last place with the Ducks being 13 points back. But again, we basically have to look at this division now with half the season already over. It's going to be hard for the Ducks to try and even compete in this division. We have to see this team as in last place right now in the division. And losing five of the last six, two of those versus the Blues, um, they're really going to have to start picking it up to, to, to make some contention in, when the playoff time comes around. Exactly. Well, we'll see. I'm going to get a chance to see the Coyotes out here. They're going to be uh, playing the L.A. Kings here uh, yeah, not too long. Yeah, definitely. They are going to be facing the Kings Thursday. Um, it'll be the fourth matchup of the year. Um, they... They may be able to gain something on the Kings because the Kings are a low-scoring team, um, but they're a team that's gathering points. Um, even though they've only had 14 goals in the last seven games, they, they're at number one in the division right now. Um, the, one, the one thing that the Coyotes can look at to try and where they can really work at the Kings is if they have power play trouble because the Kings are, have only scored three times in 53 tries in power play this season. So that's one thing where if, uh, the Coyotes have issues with their with the penalties. They they would still be able to hopefully um, hold the Kings back from scoring during those times. Exactly, and that's one thing I said about the Kings, who are a chief division rival. Of course, was they got the new coach uh, Daryl Sutter, and despite the record they have under Daryl Sutter, they've yet to lose in regulation. But 
uh, it, it reaches a point where there's a lot of there's a tremendous pressure put on a goaltender when your team is only putting up two goals a game, and that may come back to bite the Kings in the rear end at some point. But Sutter mm-hmm. has a history of making do with very low scoring teams. You know, his, his pinnacle, of course, being the 2004. Uh, getting the team to within one game of the Stanley Cup uh, championship there against the Tampa Bay Lightning. Right, and you know, the other thing is is that the Kings might have some difficulty scoring in this game, especially because Mike Smith is uh, 1.62 in goals against average in eight starts versus the Kings, and that's his lowest against any opponent that he faces. Um, but then again, on the other hand, you got Jonathan Quick, he's 1.37 on goals against the uh, excuse me, goals uh, uh, GAA, so uh, it's, it's going to be back and forth between the two teams, and it's going to be a pretty good matchup. So I hope you enjoy that game. Yeah, well, I think, it, to, to be honest, I think it's going to be a true hockey fans matchup here. It's like watching a pitching duel in baseball. You don't draw in casual fans with pitching duels, and you don't draw in casual fans to hockey games with, when it's going to be 2-1 to one or 1-0. One to nothing. So it's going to be one of those games for someone who really appreciates the game of hockey. But all you hockey purists out there, do not have your friends come and watch this game because they're going to wonder why anybody bothers when there's only going to be two or three goals scored in the entire game between the two teams. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely not a a party kind of game that you want to have on. Um, It's more for an enthusiast. But um, it's going to be a really good game, and it's really going to show – uh, two strong teams in the Pacific Division and mm-hmm. two strong teams who may be competing for um, uh, the Pacific Division title. Exactly. So looking forward to that matchup. That'll be uh, this Thursday at Staples Center. And I may or may not be there. I'm kind of on the fence about it. I have some other things going on. But you know what? That is it for the Arizona Sports Report. And it'll be just a moment here. We're going to transition into our uh, next segment here. Just a moment. All right, Sean. You know what it's time for now, don't you? Yes, sir. Let's do that NFL. Yeah, that's right. NFL playoffs, baby. It is time to separate the men from the boys, the contenders from the pretenders. It's time for everybody to show what they are made of because this weekend, it all starts. It all starts. It all starts. <laughs> well, it's sad and it's the you beginning know to I the gotta... end. And, yeah, one of the memorable images of the, uh, of the last season, that was – The New York Giants clinching, and that's just such a fitting way for the season to end with a Sunday night game for all the marbles. You have the New York Giants facing the Dallas Cowboys. Winner goes to the playoffs. Loser goes home. In the case of the Giants, had they lost, the loser may have gotten a new coach, but that's all pure speculations because the Giants won. They are in, and they're going to be one of the games that we're picking for this weekend. But let's go ahead and start. We'll go Saturday, Sunday, early game, late game, and then go to Sunday. Starting off, the Cincinnati Bengals are going to be uh, going to Houston to try to avenge a loss they had earlier. And, uh, you know, they're going to take on the Houston Texans who are playing, I think, their uh, 44th quarterback this season so far. Yeah, they definitely are picking up quite a few quarterbacks. Um, I think they finished up with Jake DeLome. I'm surprised they didn't pick up Brett Favre as well. But, uh, you know, Houston's <laughs> coming off of a three-game losing streak right now. And um, with T.J. Yates back there, I, I believe he may be injured. And um, and Jake DeLome as, as the fourth-string quarterback coming in, I, I just don't feel that they're strong enough to as an offensive team to, to move forward to the playoffs. Uh, they're definitely strong in the defense, being second, second overall. But the Bengals have, um, you know, they've had nine straight 100-yard rushing games. Um, and they've also had Andy Dalton and um, A.J. Green, who built a great rookie relationship together and are both uh, heading to the Pro Bowl. So those, com- those combinations, um, I think, might be enough to take over the Texans and-, and knock them out. Exactly. And when I look at this, uh, just the last games that were played, you have Houston, of course, um, you know, Houston – 
with, with the last game that they played. But really what I want to look at is Cincinnati playing the Ravens in that last game. And really, two plays are what killed the Bengals in that game. The Bengals really could have, should have, would have won that last game against the Ravens. So they were playing pretty well, but they got burned for two long plays by Ray Rice, and that really was their undoing. Yeah, exactly, and that's something that they're going to have to focus on and work on when they're going to be facing Houston because they're going to be facing another great defense and um, a great linebacking core, uh, especially with Mario Williams back there. Um, so they're definitely going to have to focus on that, making sure the O-line stays up and gives Andy Dalton enough time to locate A.J. Green and make that connection. Um, now, so Mario I, you know, Williams, I'm, I'm, is he going to be back? I don't know. Is he, I, I think he should be because I, that was the only question that I had was either TJ with TJ Yates being injured and Mario Williams. I didn't know if Mario Williams would be back by now, um, but I, I thought he would be. I don't know what his injury status is. Yeah, we'll have to check on that. But I think in any case, when you look at it, the Bengals, I think, are playing well enough right now. Andy Dalton is really getting settled in. Uh, Jerome Simpson with his great, that great, fantastic somersault touchdown. Too bad. You know, that should have been worth like maybe eight points if you can somersault over an opponent to get uh, to get a touchdown like that. Yeah, you know, I wish style points counted, but they don't, you know. especially. I mean, the, the thing was that he didn't just stick the land. He put his hands in the air like he was one of those people dancing up on those uh, those tripod things that they jump around on. But uh, it was great. That was, that was a play of the year for me. <laughs> Definitely. So if we pick this game, let's go ahead and go on the record. The first game that we're picking for the uh, 2011-2012 NFL playoffs, Cincinnati at Houston. On the record, I've got Cincinnati winning this game. And I think a little bit even more comfortably than we might think. I got Cincinnati winning this game, and I would call it uh, by 7 to 10 points. Yeah, you know, I, I take Cincy as well, and I call it the so-called upset that, um, you know, most analysts are saying right now. Uh, as Cincy beats Houston, and it'll be 21-14. to 14. So, yeah, seven-game seven spread. Seven-point spread. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, get to the next game, which will be uh, the volatile team against the uh, just two years removed Super Bowl champs, and that is the Detroit Lions going into New Orleans to take on the New Orleans Saints, who have really got it cranked up a notch lately. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be a, one of the best games we're going to see um, in the postseason. Uh, Drew Brees breaking Dan Marino's record. Um, Darren Sproles having the you know overall scrimmage yards um, for, for an individual for the Saints. It was great. He broke that record. These two teams match up really well. Um, offensively, they're 4-1, uh, the fourth, fourth place and first place in offense. Um, they're evenly matched up on defense at 23 and 24. The only thing, though, in the difference in this game, which we're really, we're really going to see a big difference, is the Saints' running game. With Pierre Thomas and Darren Sproles and um, those out routes that um, Drew Brees passes to Darren Sproles for those 10 to 12 yards, that's going to win the game for them for 31 to 21. All right, so you like a 10-point spread in that game. Yeah, it's good. the Lions are going to put up a pretty good fight um, mm -hmm. for the first three quarters but I feel the Saints are going to overpower them and uh, get a touchdown and a field goal in that last fourth quarter. Right. It's going to be one of those games where the intangibles come into play. And just like that last game of the season when you had the Lions you know, playing against the Packers, that was an exciting game. That's one that a non-football fan would really enjoy. A lot of scoring, teams marching up and down the field. But even right. there, you know, they come up a little bit short. And I think that's going to be the case here with the Saints. What you're going to see is, this classic case of a team that's on their way there versus a team that is already there. And that's going to be the difference in this game. And like you said, I got the Saints by 10 points also. I would say, you know, it's going to be a high-scoring game, I'd say, in the neighborhood of, I'll uh, say, 35 to 24 or so. I got it around, right around there. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's definitely reasonable. And you know what? That, you hit it right on the nail when you said that uh, the Saints obviously – You know, the Lions are obviously a young team. They had a lot of issues with Sue and younger players this year. But uh, one thing that really stood out with me with Drew Brees was I was watching the sound effects by NFL Network. And what they had created was Drew Brees was talking to um, Jimmy Graham, and obviously he's a tight end rookie, and he said to him, you know, you're an exciting kind of player, right? Jimmy Graham says, yeah, I am. He says, you're going to love the playoffs. Then. It's a different animal. 
<laughs> that right there shows, you, you know, that right there shows that Drew Brees takes control of this team and those rookie players and tries to set their mindset to a level where it'll match his and they can move forward to a Super Bowl. So uh, I definitely think they're going to win it by a 10-point spread. Yeah, very good. I, I think so, too. And as we were talking in our, our pregame, our pre-production, and you know, I said one thing is, I think the the Saints, and this is since day one when they met the Packers, I think they've been building, and you look at this team, the way that they're playing, I think they've been on a mission, and that is you have to know if you want a championship, the road goes through a certain place at certain times. The road to the championship goes to Green Bay, goes through Green Bay. If you can't beat them, you're not going to get there, and I think the Saints are gearing up for that. Now, they can't overlook this game against the Lions, obviously, and we don't want to get too far ahead. But I think uh, if they wind up playing the Saints again, or excuse me, the Packers again, that's going to be an epic, epic playoff matchup if it happens. But there yeah, are a few and, teams and that it, have something to say about it. Well, it will be it will be a great matchup, especially because the opening game of the year was the Packers and Saints. Uh, two teams that were very similar, one just outplayed the other. Now it's time for the Saints to hopefully get some retribution if they do meet up in the conference uh, conference championship game. Uh, you know, hopefully they, they can overcome it and we'll see who goes to the Super Bowl. All right, perfect. So on the record, we have both got the Saints in that game over the Lions by a pretty comfortable margin. So let's go ahead and move on to Sunday. And that is going to be the Giants against... Yes, sir. So the Falcons... The Falcons, uh, we know they went 13-3 and last year, but their first playoff game, which happened to be at home, they get dusted 41-28 to by the Green Bay Packers, who were obviously Super Bowl championship bound. I think uh, this is going to be a tough game, though, and the pressure may start to mount on Matty Ice. Like I've always said, I have seen the ice melt in pressure situations. It's not going to get any easier against the Giants, who look to be peaking at the right time here, homeboy. Yeah, you know, and um, the offenses are, are pretty evenly matched here. And you're right, when when the pressure's on and the heat's on, the ice melts. And if you look at his previous runs, um, any away games that he's had, any potential away games to get him into the playoffs that they needed to win, they lost those games. And uh, Matty Ice really needs to step up in this game if he's going to make some, some big differences because the – the, since the offenses are matched up so evenly, they need to put some space between themselves and the Giants if they want to win this game. Because you and I both know, Eli Manning at home with the two-minute warning, and you know you need a touchdown to win. He's the guy to put the, the ball in the hand, uh, put the ball in his hands. And so you know it's going to be a tough matchup. So uh, you know again, because it's so even, it's hard for me to make a decision on who's going to win this game. But again, with Eli at home, I have to stick with the Giants, and they're going to take this game. Yeah, definitely, and I see some similarities between the Giants' uh, Super Bowl run back in uh, 07 and the way this this is going here. They played the best team in the league, really, which was the Packers. They played them recently, and really they should have won that game going back. They had that uh, the late game against the Patriots who were en route to their undefeated season, and then they'd get that rematch in the Super Bowl. But I like the way the Giants play. They're, and You know, the Giants fans, they'll talk to you about it, and the Giants just can't make anything easy. Even that game against the Cowboys, they had that game in hand the whole time, but still, there was a little bit more drama in there than there needed to be. So they'll keep you on the edge of your seat, but this is a game that I don't think that yeah, the income, the outcome, excuse me, is really ever going to be in question. I like the Giants winning this game, and in fact, I'd take the Giants winning this game by... Seven points. Seven points, and then this off season is going to be rough for Matty Ice and the Falcons. It's going to be rough. So is it Matty Ice? Is it Michael Turner? Is it the coach? What's happening with the Falcons? I think those are going to be the questions they're going to have to face, especially in that Atlanta area, because he already put up the big season last year, went 13-3, and lost in the first round of the playoffs. This year, potentially another first-round loss. At what point, you know, do they start to label you a choker? It could happen. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I wouldn't say that they would label him any kind of a choker uh, if he chokes on, on this, this round. Uh, look at how long Dallas has held on to Tony Romo. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think they're going to give up on him just yet, especially since the kid's very first 
pass in the NFL with a touchdown. Um, he's, he's a good kid, and he's a good player, and he's got his head on straight. Just needs to work on some of the pressure situations. But, um, again, to the Giants are at home. Atlanta's used mm-hmm. to the Dome, and it's going to be cold. So uh, <laughs> Eli is, and, you know, as, like, like you say, you know, it's another chapter in the book of Eli. So right. he's just gonna have to he's just gonna have to write this one out, and uh, I think he'll win the game. And now, as far as this, as far as them winning by seven, I actually think the the weather is gonna be such a big factor in this game for um, for Matty Ice that the that the Giants should win by fourteen. So I think it might be Ooh. twenty-one to seven. All right, we shall see. And plus, the other good thing for the Giants is that finally, finally, they're gonna have both Brandon Jacobs and Ahmad Bradshaw in the game, healthy at the same time. Because their running attack really has been rather atrocious, but when they have those two guys healthy at the same time, which has only happened maybe three or four times this season, they do pretty well like they did against the Cowboys. Right, and definitely that one-two punch really helps out, takes a little mm-hmm. pressure off of Eli, and uh, helps him to be able to set his feet and make some of those big passes that he needs to complete to Victor Cruz. So that would be really good to get those two guys back from. All right, so according to uh, both myself and Mr. Sean Goyle here at Inside Sports, we have got Tom Coughlin getting another Gatorade bath at the end of this game on Sunday against the Atlanta Falcons. Which brings us to our final game of the day. And as many of you may have noticed, I'm wearing my vintage Steelers Jack Lambert bicentennial year jersey when they beat the Cowboys in the Super Bowl. That was their second of their six Super Bowl rings. They look to be on a march again this year. Rashard Mendenhall, though, top running back for them, goes down with a torn ACL in the last last game of the season. So it's going to really be up to Isaac Redman and Johnson to get it done there. They're going into the mile high, the mile high air of Denver. Mr. Goyle, talk to me. How do you see this game? Well, this is going to be the other AFC upset of the weekend. Now, I know you tell me not to do crap radio show, but, brother, sometimes I got to. And in this game, <laughs> Pittsburgh's going to lose to Denver, man. <laughs> so, wait a minute, like, wait a minute, like wait a minute. <laughs> I, I need to hear you say that again. Sean, <laughs> who's going to win between Pittsburgh and Denver in the 2012 playoff game at Mile High Stadium? Is Pittsburgh going to win, or is Denver going to win? Sorry, I was a little bit quiet there. I was doing Tebow time. Uh, okay. I, 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 that's just, you know, that's who's going to win. Sorry, I don't have uh-huh. my camera on me, you know. I had to do my Tebow pose. But, you know, I, I'll, I'll explain myself, you know. My craziness doesn't have some kind of decent logic behind it, though. Because you got to remember, like you said, Mendenhall's out. Torrey ACL, big running back for them. Um, he, he's... He's, well, he's a big weapon for them, helps take pressure off of Ben, um, helps with the O-line, you know, give them confidence in protecting Ben. But with him out and now Ben at 70%, I mean, we all saw the game. That twisted his ankle. I mean, he was terrible. The, in, the, in the three games that he played with his twisted ankle and his high ankle sprain, um, two of those games, he had a 52 quarterback rating and a 78 quarterback rating. That's not going to win you a Super Bowl. Now, I know Trent Dilfer and all that did it, but, again, Ben Roethlisberger is a different animal. And, um, you know, the best running team in the league, Denver, is coming into the number eight rush defense. So Pittsburgh really has some some things against them right now. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I do not agree with your pick, but I will agree that uh, T-bowing is not a crime. That's all I'll say about that. But we look at the quarterback ratings. You're someone who's thinking that the Denver Broncos are going to take down the mighty Pittsburgh Steelers, and you're talking about quarterback ratings? Seriously? Okay. t quarterback, quarterback ratings are absolutely atrocious. Atrocious, my brother. You are right. His numbers are atrocious. But, <laughs> but the only numbers that seems to matter for Denver are the last five minutes of the fourth quarter. As long as he's putting up a 150 quarterback rating, that's all that matters. And in this game, especially with the injuries that, that Pittsburgh has right now, as long as Denver keeps it close, like they have been, as long as they keep it close and give Tebow a chance, this game will end 17-14 to 14 on a field goal in mile high. Okay, all right. So we've got 
you've got the uh, the Denver Broncos putting up 17 points against the Steelers defense when they only put up 14 points against Buffalo. They put up three points against Kansas City. Now in the playoffs, they're going to put up 17 points against Pittsburgh. And mind you, Denver has lost three games in a row. And that last loss against Kansas City was at home, 7-3. to three. I understand it. I understand it. But there's one thing that Tebow does, and he builds excitement. And you know the other thing he's got on his side? Jesus Cristo. That guy's hopefully going to help him out in winning this game because he seems to talk to him a lot. So, again, <laughs> I know it's a crazy pick. You know, I know it's a crazy pick. You know, you know it's a I could have pick. him I'm committed sure. for this pick. Exactly. I know it. And most people would agree with you. In fact, the jury, there wouldn't be a juror out there that wouldn't say that I should go to jail for that one. <laughs> but the crazy thing is, is when we come back to this next week, please do bring it up because I'm sure we can rave about how I won on that one. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'll bring it up all right. It's going to be brought up. <laughs> Don't even worry about that. So, on the record, everybody, I've got Pittsburgh in this game. You have got Denver, and that is our NFL Picks of the Week. So we're just about out of time this week. The other thing is, is with Pittsburgh, I'll tell you how easy I think this game is going to be for Pittsburgh, though the score may not reflect it. When we look at all the injuries Pittsburgh has, with Mendenhall gone, with Ryan Clark also maybe not playing because of the altitude, he had all kinds of problems. The last time he played in Denver, he may not even play. And then with Roethlisberger with his ankle, I don't even think they need to treat this game as a as a playoff game. I think they could beat Denver if they had Charlie Batch starting at quarterback. That's how sure I am about this game. Will Ben Roethlisberger play this game? He doesn't even really need to. I think with their second squad, with their B squad, they could take down the Broncos in this game. That's really how mm-hmm. confident I am about the Steelers and their quest for that seventh ring. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that jersey on your back doesn't create a little bit of bias, so come on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, you know what, Sean? We're out of time, so we got to we got to get on out of here. Thanks for joining me. Uh, yeah, it was my pleasure, man. I thought it was a fun time. All right, perfect. And we'll break down the uh, next round of the playoffs next week. Same bat time, same bat channel right here inside sports. We'll do the Arizona Sports Report, and then we will break down the uh, second round of the playoffs. I'm Charles E. Smith, Jr. So for Sean Goyle, thanks for joining us. (laughs) 